Hey there, and welcome to what is technically episode 100. I am so grateful that you are here. I have realized that I put several bonuses, at least half a dozen, out there on this podcast along the way throughout its life, and this episode is technically 100, and I cannot think of a better way to celebrate that than to introduce my guest today, Lauren Duke. And we're going to talk about her new book that was just released this week, the week that I am releasing this podcast, and our conversation around her upbringing. Her book is titled Shit House, and I'm actually holding it up and showing it to the camera. That's another cool thing that I want to let you know. I'm going to put this episode out on YouTube so you can watch it if you would like to see what our interactions are. And I don't know, this could be fun. This could be a new way to just really mm, get in the full experience of these conversations. I love it. I love the idea of it. Let's do it. Let me tell you a little bit about Lauren and about her book, Shit house, okay? (laughs) I'm just going to read from the back of the book what this is about. Lauren was seven when she helped her stepfather boost rum bottles from the local liquor store. The following year, her biological father took took her to a hotel room and shot up heroin in the bathroom. The next day, he robbed a bank with a finger gun. When he was released from prison years later, he moved into Lauren's basement. They spent the weekends smoking cartons of cigarettes, diving into dumpsters, and swindling used cars. Lauren's upbringing provided her with only one lens through which she saw herself. Shame. That shame overflowed into every aspect of her life. Hmm. I'm going to continue. I just want you to sit with that for a minute and just take that in and acknowledge and understand that she did not have the best upbringing. We're going to talk about her book. We're also going to talk about the process of writing this memoir and what it did to her for her personally. In so many ways, it was such a healing process. That is going to be the majority of this conversation. So if you're really looking for all of the dirty details, read the book because they are here in detail, 100%. Moving along um, with this, this particular conversation and with the explanation of the book. Okay, I'm going to read some more. In this compassionate and gritty real life fairy tale, Lauren Dolly Duke shows how it's possible for good people to do bad things and what it takes to create peace with where you come from in order to find happiness. Let me read that part again what it takes to create peace with where you come from in order to find happiness. This raw and humorous account of trauma, transcendence, and resilience challenges the binary of good versus evil and lays out the evolution of shame psychology and intergenerational trauma. It seeks to answer the question of how we unravel ourselves from the history and patterns of our families. Shithouse is a beautifully written map that draws back to the personal root of where sabotaging behavior, shame, and limitations are born. This is absolutely an amazing story, and it isn't about, I want to be very clear with you, it isn't about comparing the despair, it isn't about looking at this book and looking at Lauren's life and her bearing her soul in such a raw and real manner. It isn't an invitation to compare that and say, oh, well, my shit isn't nearly as bad as her shit. Or even on the flip side, my shit is worse. I have even even more 
stories than what she is sharing here. It's not about that. It's about recognizing and coming back into yourself that you are not your history, the family in which you are born. And by the way, they are not bad people. They aren't. They are simply humans doing their human thing. It is so freaking amazing. And I also want to let you know what Lauren is up to today, by the way. Okay. She, um, she has taught thousands of yoga students over the past 15 years and led dozens of international retreats. And she continues to push the edge between yoga, mental health, and trauma. She found it a one-of-a-kind community center and yoga studio in Encinitas, California, in a sea of corporate yoga, where most independent studios don't survive, she created a thriving community teaching and hosting a variety of sold-out yoga classes, educational seminars, and writing workshops. She devotes her time to helping educate people on the autonomy of trauma and how those experiences are woven in to the tapestry of our lives. I think that is just about the best introduction I can possibly give is just to read the back of her book to you and let you know how freaking amazing she really is. And I'm telling you the energy that she emits just having a conversation with her is life changing. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It really is. And the last thing I want to share before I go ahead and, and, and share the actual conversation that we had, the last thing that I want to share with you is that very recently I downloaded on Audible Alanis Morissette's Words and Music. And it just, ooh, I get chills. Oh my God, I get chills even thinking about what that did for me, just hearing that. Because a lot of times I will listen to podcasts or audiobooks, but this one in particular, and it's only about 90 minutes, is just Alana's talking. And then she will sing a song acoustically, of course. And then she'll talk some more and tell a backstory and sing another song. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And in so many ways, I thought of that, I thought of Lauren when I heard that because like being reintroduced to Thank You, for example, the song Thank You, right, um, was just like so visceral, so, so deep. And if you are watching this on my YouTube channel, I will put the link in show notes if you would rather switch over to that. If you are watching this and you see Lauren, she will probably remind you very much of Alanis Morissette. I mean, it's just her energy, the way that she presents and everything. It's just a beautiful, beautiful expression. And I'm so grateful that you're here for this today. Enjoy. Welcome, Lauren, to the podcast. What lights you up, my friend? Um, I would say probably very similar to you. Um, helping people feel better. Mm, ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Not just helping people, but helping people feel better. Be okay. Be okay. Yeah. Be okay with what? Um, the experiences they've had in their lives, their histories, their present moment, um, their physicality, their bodies, their minds, their mm. spirits. Mm. Mm. That is, it's so resonating with me because of where, you know, of course I am a life coach and there is a lot of mindset work within life coaching. There is a lot of being in your mind. So I love that you start out with mind, body, spirit. Yeah. You know, it's cool. like the whole thing. Yeah. And I think that um, this is the next piece of my work, but the more people recognize that the mind, body, spirit is all existing on a continuum, the better. What is happening in people's minds are playing out in their bodies. It's manifesting in their relationships. It's manifesting in their work um, paradigms. And, you know, it, it really is everything. It's affecting their physiology, nervous system, brain. Um, you know, we actually 
the reality is we, we can, we really can influence our minds and, and, um, and that's kind of a, a big piece of my mission and my vision. I love that. I love that so damn much. Can I tell you how much I love that? <laughs> I mean, because we live in our heads, we live in our heads. We just do. We live in our heads and we live in we're our disembodied. Memory. And yeah. we're disembodied and we live in our memories, which is a great segue into. Absolutely. Shit house. Shit house. Yeah, girl. <laughs> Your memoir is off the chains. I mean, wow. it is, I mean, it is, oh God, it hit me in so many ways. Um, I, I can't even express, but there is one for sure that I want to start with in terms of just, I mean, I mean within the first few pages, you had me mm -hmm. and you said uh, right here, our parents aren't superheroes. They damage us as much as they love us. Yeah. When did you, uh, when did you find out your parents weren't superheroes, <laughs> my, my friend? <laughs> mm. Oh, I think the big perspective of it really came through writing this book. But I think very mm. early on, I knew that, um, you know, my parents were just really fallible, kind of damaged people. And mm -hmm. You know, I had a, um, an inkling since I was a very little kid that this is not, I mean, a lot of people have crazy lives, you know, but sure. I just, I knew because I had um, perspective from watching my neighbors and watching other people in my school and watching other people's parents that like something was going on at my house, <laughs> you know, yeah. that was, like, not what was going on with other people. Now I know in the big global spectrum of things that a lot of people live in this way, but mm -hmm. um, relatively speaking in the, you know, kind of privileged area that I grew up in, uh, things were different for me, but I think really through the process of writing this book and, and uh, you know, writing is a, um, it is, it is something else and it yeah. really forces you to look at things from so many different perspectives and you zoom in and you zoom out. Mm -hmm. And as I was zooming out kind of years into writing the book and really looking at the lineup of dysfunctional characters in the book, which are all just archetypal characters. They're not just my family members. They're literally everybody's family members. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. um, I started to recognize that, uh, wow, like the more I zoomed out and I really had to investigate to, to do character development, to build the characters, I had to really examine the characters. Yeah, And that means I had to examine my mother. I had to examine my father. I had to uh, examine, you know, just my stepfathers, you know, all the, the characters that are in the story, I really had to look at them and their multidimensionality to, to, to build the book as viscerally as I did. And yeah. at least I think I did. I don't know. Maybe I didn't. Maybe we'll find out it's total no. shit. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, no, it is visceral. It is raw and real. And that is what I am here for. I am always here for the rawness. Hey. I am here for the authenticity. I'm here for the exposure. And yeah. you are really bearing yourself. It's like, I, I think, I, I, I think, and it, if you didn't say this in the book, you it maybe even alluded to it, or I made the, the alignment in, in my own head of just like running naked through the streets of, yeah. right? Around well, the neighborhood or something. I mean, it was, it, it's just like stripping down, putting this, this shit but it is but but it's but it's also life yeah putting it out there in such a raw manner is an exposure yeah well I realized and this was kind of the beginning of the path um I was not doing well mm -hmm. I it was 2014 not too many years before I had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder I had um irritable bowel syndrome I won't get into the slew of things that were going on for me physically and mentally, but I was not well. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that if I didn't, and I wasn't well because of what I was carrying. 
Mm-hmm. And I recognized that if I didn't give my story and my history an outlet, that I wasn't going to be well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I was going to stay sick and, and tired. And so I really just started writing. And I always kind of wanted to be a writer. I had always known that my story was 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 worth writing. I went to journalism school. I didn't finish journalism school, but now I'm finishing, actually. I'm almost finished. woo <laughs> 20 years later. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I recognize that if I didn't have some expression for the things that had happened to me, I was going to not be in a good situation. And so I just started getting it out in uh, the way that felt the most nonviolent. And that was on paper, mm. you know? So, and that was like, it's so fascinating because I feel like that's kind of led me into the work that I'm doing and will continue to do. But like, I really started to see through this whole process that as I was writing and as I was really looking at my history and the things that had happened, and again, the characters and the things that the characters had been through, because the characters, um, I mean, of course, they're my family members as well, you know, but, but after I finished the book, I realized like, oh my God, they're not just my family members. These are just like human beings. These are everyone's family members, you know, like the lineup of everyone's family, even if it's not like in the same, um, you know, uh, spectrum or construct of my, as mine. But, um, yeah, as I was writing, I started to feel better and simultaneously I was, you know, doing therapy and doing lots of different things, but the writing was the most powerful thing that I was doing that, that helped me get clear and helped me kind of reorganize my history and my um, reality and all of like my physical symptoms started to heal. Wow. And I started sharing my story. And this is one of the, you know, there's social media can be so toxic. And this was one of the really powerful ways that I was able to use social media as I started mm-hmm. to share my story. Mm-hmm. And as I did that, um, I started getting private messages from other people who it was inspiring them to share their stories and to, again, express the things that had happened to them or to tell the truth or to have real, honest, vulnerable conversations. And so that ended up leading to the whole publication of it. I'm like, oh my God, this can help other people. You know, it's, it's, it is, it's, it is helping other people. It's like, uh, it was helping me and it was helping other people. Your exposure is bringing to light what so many of us keep in the dark. Yeah. Is what is that that is that is what is coming to me as you are expressing that is is just that and i absolutely agree with you on social media i do there is a lot of bullshit on social and there is a lot of beauty and there is a lot of connection if you you know there are just all kinds of ways that you can, um, that people can connect and share. And as you just described, oh my God. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reality is, is secrets keep you sick. You know, secrets keep, keep you ashamed. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, I mean, I've, I really have never had a barometer, um, like my threshold and tolerance for bullshit is low. Mm -hmm. And so I've always kind of been, you know, someone who just wants to get to the heart of things. Like sometimes it's hard. Small talk is like, that doesn't, you know, if you ever see me in an environment where someone's trying to small talk me, I'm trying to like run to the bathroom and climb out the window, you know? Um, And, and it really, it's like, okay, I can, I can write this story and I can write it to the place that's appropriate and not be okay, mm-hmm. or I can tell the truth. And in telling the truth, I mean, you know, they say the truth sets you free and it really does. And the truth heals you and it, and, and it connects you to other people. And, and, and that's what most of us are missing. We're missing like our social support and a safe place to land because we, we really have mm. been conditioned to tell a version of the truth that can be digested rather than the real human truth, which sometimes feels um, undigestible, but it's real. But it's real. Exactly. Oh, it is so real. This is so good. And it's like, 
these are the times in which we are living like right now. The times in which we are living and the times in which we grew up, including your, your trauma, traumatic experiences, which I do want to talk about because I want to give our listeners a, um, you know, just a glimpse into what this story is about yeah. so that they can understand how much it may possibly resonate. But I think that we are getting to that place in our current world in our, our, our current space where we, we have created that space for those stories. And it's not, it isn't so shocking anymore. I mean, that is my take on it. It's like, yeah. oh, okay. So yeah, that happens. Yeah. I mean, I, we, need that. we, we, need we that. do. But when I started this in 2014, mm-hmm. that is not mm-hmm. what our global climate was. Right. And, and it was so fascinating because now I feel like trauma, trauma, trauma. But when I started doing this work and I, while I was writing this book, I was, you know, educating, I went through the somatic experiencing training. I trained with Bessel van der Kolk. Like I was doing all sorts of trauma education to understand myself, which is ultimately helping me understand people in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But it wasn't a, it wasn't the temperament of the climate, the climate, you know, it's like, and I feel, I'm so glad that we're, um, we're evolving to get to that place where we can talk about, um, the bad things that have happened. But, uh, the challenging thing with that is that it can go both ways. It can, especially with our, how much access we have to social media and technology, Mm -hmm. Is it also keeping us traumatized? Yeah. Yes. You know what I mean? Because yes. the way, how are we going to, we're resilient beings and the piece, what happens, like not everything is a happy ending, but I used my writing as a way to bounce back as mm-hmm. a way to reframe my story and heal myself, which was about self-preservation and ultimately resilience and self-empowerment. And mm-hmm. that's what we need. We need people recognizing that, you know, the things that they've been through, they can heal from. Mm -hmm. And that we need to tell the whole story. And that's also a piece of the writing too. You know, you start with just all the shitty things that happen and then you get in there and you really start digging, digging, digging. And you recognize, we recognize that there's actually some good stuff in there too. Yes, (laughs) yes, yes. Especially, you know, again, memories and memoirs. And I've, you know, talked with a few authors now, and I just know myself intuitively that everyone has their own take on what happened and how it happened. And it shifts over time. You know, our our perspective changes, our perceptions and everything changes. The way that we say, and you have said this a couple of times now in a couple of different ways, but the way that we view other human beings comes from the way that we view ourselves first so when you do that work and then you start seeing the other humans around you that changes the story entirely oh my gosh okay so that's so perfect that you just said that because really the keystone of this book is about generational trauma Mm. and you know everything that um my mother had been through that influenced her own um you know, mental perspective. That's what she taught me. Yeah. And my, and that was limited. Her mindset was limited to what she'd been taught. Yep. What she'd been taught from her mother was limited to what that woman was taught. Exactly. From her mm-hmm. And so what I recognized for me is like, oh my gosh, especially as I, uh, uh, as I was, you know, kind of coming closer towards the end of the book, I was like, oh my gosh, everyone is just kind of speaking through some really micro lens and seeing the world through this very micro lens. And that is affecting the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see what we're worth, the way that we see uh, what kind of job we should have, Mm -hmm. what we're worth in relationship. Mm -hmm. Like it's all a bunch of made up bullshit belief systems that actually aren't true. Yeah. And we really can, if we can recognize that, and that was my journey through, you know, the chrysalis of this, um, 
the, the things that I'd been taught were not really true. Mm-hmm. And that I had to, all the things that I was carrying, because it was hard for me to separate myself from where I came from and some of the things that I did as a result of just my own ignorance and my family's ignorance, mm-hmm. I could make my way out of that and I could be anything I wanted. And that's where I'm at now. And and what I see is like, like I remember being in that place where it's like, well, I could never have a partner like that because I'm not worth it. Or I could never finish my college degree because no one in my family ever has and we don't finish anything. So I'm not going to finish it. Or I can't have that job because I'm not worthy of it. And that's like everyone's core wound is I'm not good enough. But that belief system is bullshit. And when you recognize that your belief systems really are just constructed through family lineage and that it's not really earthly, globally true, Right. Just what you've been taught. Then there's a permission there that's like, okay, I'm just going to fucking let that go. (laughs) Yeah. And be, but you, but I feel like you have to really drown first and come up, you know, Mm -hmm. all the way to the surface to get there. And that was kind of my, that was my process. Let's talk about the drowning because I want, because I want our listeners to understand the depths of what your, uh, what your exposure through this book is about. And it is, I mean, you did not have the best parental role models. I mean, you know, like seriously. Sorry, that is so laughable. <laughs> I, I, I know. Well, I mean, that's the best, that's uh, the best I can, that's, yeah. that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, your mom, it, it, it took me uh, probably three quarters of the way through the book to even, uh, have you revisit your mom because you were because it was so focused on your dad and and all of your stepdads your mom's boyfriends you know that kind of thing and all of the experiences that you had along the way but we're talking about things like you being involved in um what uh stealing liquor at the you know at the liquor store with your uh with one of your stepdads yeah right? wait that's not normal <laughs> right, right. Well, but no, that's that. That's my question. Is like you were, were, were you? Were, how old were you? I think I was seven. Yeah. See, so yeah. you're seven years old, and you're distracting the cashiers at the liquor store while your stepdad is, you know, just filling up his pockets with the bottles, it's sweatpants, <laughs> in, in sweatpants, which is great. I know. Yeah, you go through all all of the all of those details, which is just fascinating. Um, but, it, but yeah, I, I just, I'm reading that and I'm thinking this kid is seven years old. This, yeah. this soul, this, this human being is seven years old and she's just going, I mean, exactly what you said. That was my thought in reading that. I was like, she's like, well, this is just what people do. This is what kids do for the adults around them. They, they distract the cashiers. Yeah with, you know, cute conversation while their dad steals liquor. That's just what everybody does, right? That's what we're, no matter what, like we are, we are wired to believe in our parents. We are wired like that because if we, I mean, just from animals, you know, if you go back phylogenetically, it's like, yeah, if, if a, baby animal does not trust its parental figure it's just going to go out into the wild on its own and die you exactly know? It's, yeah. it's like survival of the fittest and so we're wired we are hardwired to to protect these people and um you know and and, and it ultimately ends up being really hard for me it was just normal you know like mm-hmm. Of course, like I recognize I'm not going to get any other life. Like nobody's coming to save me. And that was hard, you know, because what that made me think like is that I I wasn't I wasn't good enough to be taken care of. And mm-hmm. that really yeah. affected yeah. me for, you know, uh I mean it still does. Like I sure. can't say it's like you know, something happened a few years ago and I was like, "Oh, that's still there." Like 2 years ago, you yeah. know. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that, 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 I mean, it's deep, it's deep for everyone. And, and, um, but you know, I, I did, I, I, even though, um, I, I was, it makes sense that I did a lot of the things that I did later on in my life, considering 
the foundation that I had considering my family was a bunch of criminals and drug addicts, considering that my mom was negligent and neglectful and an alcoholic. Um, I mean, all of it, like now in the context of everything that happened and really basically solving my own puzzle or my own riddle, I'm so able to forgive some of the things that I did that made me feel so ashamed mm -hmm. because I see that it wasn't even my fault. And that is where we need to get as a culture for people because people have so much self-shame and self-loathing because yeah. we do things in an attempt to feel okay in a moment or protect ourselves in a moment, whether it's, okay, I'll get in the backseat of the car with this guy because I don't want to be rejected from this, you know, or um, I'll go with my stepdad to, you know, steal the liquor bottle bottles from Thrifty because that's, you know, if not, is he yeah. still going to love me? And also right. on top of that, you don't want your parents to go to jail. And my father was already in jail. And so mm -hmm. I was always worried that everyone around me was going to go to prison. So I was going to do everything that I could do, um, to keep them around. Yeah. To, to keep, keep them, them around. around. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, and it was just so, um, innate. It was yeah. innate. It was, it was my own evolution. Like I, I got to keep these people around. Otherwise I'm going to die, you know, mm -hmm. which, which now I realize is like, it really took me going through therapy to recognize. And that's like at the, you know, back like second to last chapter of the book, but it really took a therapist being like, you do realize that the things you went through were not okay, that it was not okay for these, you know, people to do the things they did to you. It, cause I, I excused all of it. Yeah, I excused all of it. Like, cause it's, oh, it's normal. It's just what I went through, but it really took me, like I had to go through the full spectrum of like anger, rage, sadness, um, grief, all the, all the stages of everything to be able to get to the other side of it and, and, you know, forgive these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And your dad, I, your, your, your biological father came in and out of your life. Just, it seems like, it seems like in in a almost oh, how do I how do I put it like a like he was a a tornado <laughs> right I mean yeah. he just kind of showed up like a storm and he was there and you know and but but because he was there it's like oh let me attach to to him and go along with whatever and you went along with whatever I mean you're like <laughs> driving along the freeway at what 12 or you know 13 yeah. whatever yeah. um yeah. which is which is fine no judgment I grew up in the sticks and I yeah. was driving when I was 12 too um but I was in the sticks yeah. <laughs> so so you know it's got to be stressful to be growing up in that kind of environment I say that from from this place in in looking at it but having lived it yeah. I also understand that when you are in that place you're like oh again as you said this is normal this is normal this is how it is I just need to suck it up because my dad's in the back seat getting high and I've got to keep this car on the road yeah well um the thing that you're talking about is called survival mode. Right. <laughs> right. And, you mm -hmm. know, it's so fascinating because I did not know that I spent my whole life in survival mode. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until many years later when I got sick and when yeah. I was diagnosed with PTSD, that the way that I had been raised and what I had lived through had wired my nervous system mm -hmm. for that level of constant chaos. Yeah. And that I was playing that chaos out also in every aspect of my life at work, um, with friendships, with men, with family members. And at some point for all of us, our bodies say, I can't do this anymore. And we start getting symptoms, whether it's 
my sort of symptoms, I couldn't drive in a car anymore. Um, I couldn't drive a car anymore. Mm. I, you know, all the things that were going on with me, I was having these constant panic attacks. I was fainting and that's a whole other, um, discovery that I've made along the way that now is part of my nervous system education, um, that I do with other people. But yeah, I mean, it's all like, that was just survival mode. And years later, I realized that that takes a toll and Mm -hmm. we can only sustain that level of stress and survival for so long before it begins to manifest in our bodies Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as whatever, some disease, illness, you know, and, and that's where I was headed, you know? And, um, Yeah. So, um, but the interesting thing is, is that we are, we're resilient, you know, and we can rehabilitate our nervous systems and we are learning our nervous systems, um, before we even come out of the womb, you know, whatever the system of the mother or whatever, whoever day, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, we're learning, we're learning those systems and they become familiar and, and they become our own system, you know? And, and so it's really fascinating. You know what? I, it, it just, I had highlighted another passage in, in your book and what you're talking about right now, I feel like is very, um, necessary, if you will, to, to bring up. And it is that, Uh, Again, in the very beginning, you said, I'd soon find out that parents don't really die. Mm -hmm. They just disappear and moonlight later as tap dancers inside our bodies, affecting every move we ever make. Yeah. And that, I, that hit me in some kind of way when I read that, because uh, I was even thinking about the generational trauma thing. I was already thinking about that. I was thinking about that for myself. I was certainly thinking about that for you. But I was looking at it from the perspective because of the work that I have also done and I am also still doing. It's like, we're not finished. We're not, No, uh, there's no finish line here. No. Okay. Um, but that that whole ancestral healing, that particular um passage really hit me because I was just like yeah yeah and what about the the who who else is who who tap danced in my mother and father's yeah. bodies and this is this is exactly, that and yes yeah I mean this is exactly what I'm talking about um you know by the end of the book there's this and and I write about this and 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 I I speak about it now but I I had my own revelation of it's nobody's fault right? because we always want to blame someone. And like, Mm -hmm. I wanted to blame my mother. Mm -hmm. And because even though the book is about all these other things, kind of the, you know, the, the keystone, another keystone and kind of centerpiece of the book is this, you know, really damaged relationship that I had with my mother. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, you know, can, can relate to that, but that was kind of a huge kind of reckoning for me and revelation for me is really thinking about the things that my parents also went through. And then he just like passed it on to me, like some leftovers or something. Mm -hmm. And what it takes to break those cycles is awareness. Mm -hmm. And without a recognition that, oh boy, there's that thing playing out again that my mom used to do and her mom did to her and we don't stop it. Yeah. But we are living in a culture that it's like a cultural rebellion to be still and self-reflect. That's, Mm -hmm. that is not what we are primed to do. We are primed to go fast. We are primed to scroll social media. We are primed to believe everything that shows up on the news and on our TVs. And it's so toxic for people's systems, like, because it's making us, it's too much. Yeah. It's too much. And we all already have enough to process just with the things that have happened to us. And like, that was another big thing coming out of writing the book. I'm like, oh boy, I'm, I, it, 
my story is not special. I, I just wrote it. Right. I, I was brave enough to write it and mm-hmm. I did the work to, mm-hmm. to get it on the page and to work with all the, you know, writing coaches and editors and copy editors and publishers and publicists and blah, blah, blah. Like I followed it through, but my story is not an isolated story. No. My story in some way, shape or form is everybody's story. Agree. And the only way that I believe that we're going to have a collective healing is if we recognize that, that all this stuff that we're learning, it's not necessarily relevant anymore. That we, sure, we have all of these kind of generational and collective culture influences, but we can choose to be something different. We can choose to go another way. We can choose to take a deep breath rather than always moving so fast. Mm -hmm. And it's all a choice. And we don't recognize that. Like even my mom, my mom would just say, you know, she would just make these blanket statements because this is what people said to her. Like, well, this is just how things are. It's like, no, this is not how things are. This is, this is what you're teaching me. And luckily I'm a critical thinker and I'm going to. I'm going to really investigate this, you know, and, and everyone in my family, not everyone, but a lot of people in my family are so annoyed with me about that because they just make these general statements. And it's like, we've just made this general statement about what it means to be a human. And then we throw it on people mm-hmm. like a big old, you know, blanket. Yeah. And then people just Sherpa it around for the rest of their lives. And then they see their whole <laughs> realities through that, you know, giant fleece coat that they can't see clearly through, you know, and Anyway, I just like, I believe, like, I am not special. I just believe that if I can do it, if I can do this work, if I can be someone who can get through what I have been through and still come out the other side empowered and like, I'm going to fucking live my life to the best and I'm not going to let anyone hold me back, then everyone can. And that Mm -hmm. is what I don't see people doing that I want so deeply to see people doing. I love that, Lauren. And first of all, I mean, you are so very special and you are so very unique. Every one of us is, you know, and I, but what you're saying is my story is your, at the same time, I'm like, I'm not special yet. I am, I am unique. And my story is also your story. And that comes back to how we are all connected. Yeah on a global level, like yeah. all of humanity, all of us, you know, I've, of course, I've talked to many people and in terms of, you know, this generational trauma that you're talking about and the things that are passed down, it's like every one of us tries to do just a little bit better and a little bit better, I think. That's what I've seen. I've seen my mother try to do just a little bit better than her mother gave to her, right? You know, maybe, maybe a lot, maybe a lot better, right? And then well, good for I, your mom. <laughs> because well, good, good for her, but she, yeah. you know, but I, I had all kinds of issues with her. I had yeah. all kinds of issues with my mother, you know, and, 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 and now it's like, I think just coming to that awakening and awareness is like, you know what? She just, she was once a little girl too. Yes. Oh my God. That's it that's, right there. It's like everyone basically needs to do yeah. their inner child work. And mm-hmm. when you do your inner child work, you start seeing everyone mm-hmm. like an inner child. You see their inner child just like throwing a fit, yeah. you know, but like. Yeah. And I said it, I said, you know, actually, I don't remember if I exactly said this because I said so many things in the book, who knows, but something about like letting our parents off the hook and and not necessarily for them, but Mm -hmm. for our own health and wellness and, you know, spiritual wellness and physical wellness and mental wellness, because when you don't forgive them, when you are in pain, when you don't resolve the things that have happened to you, you get sick. And you Mm -hmm. cannot live your best life when you are not well, Mm -hmm. you know, when you are constricted. And one of the big pieces of, of this story is giving people permission to tell their messy ass, dirty, shitty story. Yeah. Because it's not like, I get that we're coming from a generation of baby boomer parents who Mm -hmm. came from a generation of, you know, parents who were in World War II and everything was this nuclear family, everything just 
two yeah. and a half kids, you lived in your little house and everything looked perfect and you just sweep everything under the rug. Yes. But what we're doing, what we're recognizing in particularly my generation, I'm, I am, I'm about the older end of the millennial. And that's why they call us like the therapy or the wellness generation. It doesn't work. Sweeping mm -hmm. things under the rug and mm -hmm. not taking care of yourself and, you know, not taking care of your kind of historical events. It just makes you sick. And that is why, like, we literally, our culture is sick. Yes. That's what's happening. We yes. are sick. And, and that is why so many people are, you know, I also want to say that, that um, and I want to believe that, that everyone is doing a little bit better than where they come from. Right. I want to believe that, but it's not true. And I, I say that because so many people have been through so much that they, that has not been resolved or reframed or reorganized in their own bodies, mind systems, that they can't tolerate their realities. Mm -hmm. And so they end up on drugs. Mm -hmm. And that is half the people in my family. I mean, my brother is a heroin addict and we haven't even seen him, you know, I mean, half the people in my family were heroin addicts, but so they want to be better. But when you can't tolerate your reality because your re reality is so painful because right. you haven't done your work, then you do things to help you tolerate your reality. And that is why I'm so addicted. Yeah, numbing. And an and, 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 and escape. It's, it's, yeah. it's an escape from reality. And I don't judge any addict or um, any, anyone. Even uh, for before you understand it, you can't. Because it's so, right. oh my God, that makes yeah. so much sense. Like yes. if I was him and hadn't done any therapy, my brother, I'd probably also be on heroin. Right. Right. And, and it is, no, I, I don't, I don't necessarily, I didn't mean to imply that everyone does. I think that it is a, um, it is accessible to us. It yes. is accessible to us to do that. I think we have the capacity to. We have, yes, thank you. We have the capacity. And unfortunately, the people that, you know, we're talking about now aren't going to listen to a podcast and they're not going to read a book. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to read a book and they're not going to not going to read my book. And, that's for them. <laughs> and they probably don't have access to therapy and they, you know, they may not True. have that. So, yep. you know, that is the unfortunate reality in, you know, in our world is that not everyone has access to this. So if you are listening and if you do have access to um, dig in and really look at your soul and what it really needs what you really need it is going into those dark corners hard as fuck it is the hardest fucking thing to do it really is yeah. um it's not pretty but it's necessary because for you to come out of um a the type of childhood that you had the shit house. The <laughs> shit house for you to come out of that into. Let's talk about what you, you know, what you, what did you build out of that? Yeah. That, you know, out of that work that you did, I mean, it, you know, and it, and it's not, it did not come naturally to you because no. everything, every adult in your life, every adult parental figure in your life modeled the worst fucking behavior imaginable. Yeah. Going yeah. to prison, robbing places, doing whatever, you know, that kind of thing and took you along for the ride some of the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, every, every parental figure in your life showed you how not to be. Yeah. No one showed me how to get to where I am. And it's, right. I feel like there, I feel like it was my destiny. I mean, really. Yeah. Um, because I, because I, so very young realized I was not okay. There was a class that I took in high school and it was a yoga class and it was my like gym class basically. 
And even though I was like such a juvenile delinquent and I was so mean to my yoga teacher and I wish I one day can find her again, Mrs. Olive, if you're listening, I'm, I apologize to you, <laughs> but I was so terrible to her because I just thought it was the stupidest thing ever. And because I just had so much in my mind and body, I didn't know how to be still, but I remember for tiny glimmers of those classes, I felt okay. And I didn't know why. And so I kept kind of chasing that even though I couldn't articulate what was happening inside of me. Um, and by the time I was like 18 or 19, I had taken a few more yoga classes. And again, I kept chasing, couldn't articulate it, couldn't understand what was happening in my physiology and in my mind. I just thought it was some like mystical cosmic shit that, that was like, you know, descending from the gods down onto me. And it wasn't something that I could actually recreate in myself, which I found out later is so not true, which is part of what I do now is educate people on the nervous system. But um, I kept chasing that thread of feeling better. And it led me to yoga. Um, yoga led me to therapy. Uh, therapy led me to a PTSD diagnosis. The PTSD diagnosis uh, led me into more trauma therapy, trauma education, trauma work. I took that trauma work and started integrating it into my yoga classes. My yoga classes now are literally like um, a platform to, uh, or a portal to really understand your nervous system, your sensations, your mind, how your body actually works. Um, and writing, that's another, you know, cathartic um, outlet that his, the yoga led me to as well, because you know, yoga, the culture of yoga is really reflective and writing is writing and journaling and doing dream work and inner child work and all this stuff that seems like a bunch of blah, 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 woo, woo shit is actually really powerful. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I ended up writing the book. That's how I ended up, you know, getting into all the nervous system work. That's how I healed my own PTSD. And that is now the work that I'm doing. And, and, um, I am finishing my degree and I just applied for my master's and PhD in somatic psychotherapy. So, mm. um, you know, all of my work has just been a bridge, I, I think, to really get me to this place to understand a nervous system in a really pragmatic and practical way and to be able to use yoga and writing as a um, template to be able to educate people on their own mind-body systems. The whole of our being. Right? It's all connected. It's like everything. It is not my just our mind. Oh my God. I love that. I mean, seriously, it it's my destiny. I love that you're saying that because you can reflect. I correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what this is my my own personal download that's happening right now is that it's like kind of coming to almost, for lack of a better word, an appreciation for having had those experiences because yes. it led you to where you are today. Well, I, I have, I don't have regrets because I just don't believe in that mm -hmm. um, because that's all past stuff. Um, I just have an acceptance of what I've been through. And mm -hmm. Oftentimes when, you know, when people meet me or they hear anything about my story or, um, you know, they read the book, they're like, God, I'm so sorry for what you've been through. I am not. Yeah. Because of what I've been through, I like that became the foundation to basically launch me into a world where I understand something that a lot of people don't understand. And my mission is literally to educate people on how their minds and bodies work so that way they literally can take care of themselves, have agency and self-preservation and not reach outside of themselves for help because yeah. it's all right here, but yeah. we're not taught that. We're not taught how to influence our physiology. We're not taught about mental health. We're not taught about any of that. And I mean, that's been like, I just feel like my, my soul work, my future work is all mental health advocacy and nervous system education, mm. which is well, all trauma work. It's trauma resolution work. I love that, Lauren. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, that I had, I had wanted to ask, and I think this kind of fits into the whole conversation about, about the book was, I, I think it is the tiny dark places chapter that was just so raw and so like, so 
full of detail about the trauma. Yeah. And I, I, I thought about that as I read that, I thought, who, you know, could I say those things? Could I admit to the world those things? And I feel as if you had already answered that in what you are saying now. It's like, okay, by being the example, in this regard, I'm not special in terms of everyone has their thing. Um, everyone has their tiny dark place. Yeah. Um, that they're keeping a secret of yeah. and holding in their body. And um, the, your, cathartic, your cathartic experience was to put that out there and just say, this is what happened to me. This is when I started detaching. This may not have been when you started, but definitely was a good catalyst for when, you know, for detaching for a long time yeah. from your body. Well, the reality is, is until you get bold, you do not get better. And mm. until you are willing to by the way, I've never said that before. I like that. I like that too. Yeah, I think bold, that's, you do not get better. I and, think that's going to be the title of this episode. I love <laughs> it. You can use it. I mean, I just, woo, I mean, I said it, so I hope I can use it. Um, yeah. You know, until you get really honest and real, you just don't heal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, it, you, you stay locked up in your own prison. And so that's why, like, I'm not excusing the things that the characters in the story and, and that my family has done. Mm -hmm. I, um, but what I am doing is, um, having my own inner resolutions with it. So I cannot be locked inside the prison that I was locked in for so long because mm -hmm. I was so angry at people. Yeah. And so I'm just choosing, like, I love my mom. We have a, you know, very, funny. We have more of a relationship right now than ever before. I own a house, not that far from her house. I spend okay. more time with her than ever. Yeah. Um, but we don't talk about anything. It's just bullshit, you know? Yeah. And I recognize my mom, if she acknowledged, and she will probably read this book, you know, she knows about the book. We just don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And when she reads it, I don't know. It might, or maybe she won't read it because it's too painful for her. That's her process. That's not my responsibility to, you know, think about how she's going to process this. My, my job is to process, you know, my own experience in my own life. But, yeah. um, what I, what I do know to be true is that, um, when we're angry and when we don't forgive and when we have resentment, um, we're just locked in our own prisons and I don't want to be there anymore. Yeah. Enough of my family members have been in real prison right. and been in kind of this theoretical prison. Um, and I needed to set myself free. And, and I think everyone needs to set themselves free. And yeah. if, if people do not find a, some sort of outlet to um, process their life, people are going to stay sick. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's my mission is to, you know, get people to recognize like, if you're, you know, you don't get better till you get bold, or if you're not bold, you don't get better, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. And, and by bold, it's like, it, it's, it's also like, it, it's vulnerable. Yeah. Right. It's vulnerability. Yeah. It's saying, um, it, and it's back to that exposure. You know, and, and, and putting and putting your whole self out there just as you are, as you know it, just raw and real and visceral. And here I yeah. am. Well, I think what helps with that, and um, gosh, I, I, I should have, you know, prefaced this a while ago, but having a really, um, I didn't have a secure attachment until my husband. Mm -hmm. And my I met my husband. Well, I've been with him. I'm through, I just turned 39. And I... Uh, I've been in a like romantic relationship with him since I was 30 mm -hmm. and um, he was my first primary attachment. And so it wasn't until I had a safe place to land that I could finally start doing my work. And so if you don't have the social support, if you don't have a therapist, if mm -hmm. you don't have people that you can trust, mm -hmm. if you don't have people you can lean into, it's, it's not impossible, 
but um, it does make it much more difficult to, yeah. to do your work. Like you need to have some place that you can land that is safe after, you know, at the end of the day, after you do this kind of work, because, um, you know, you're, you're basically like excavating not just your personal history, but in some ways your, your, the, the ancestral history and your collective history, you know, there's so mm -hmm. much in a body, mm -hmm. there's so much in a body. And so when you start doing your, you know, trauma work or healing work or therapy, it's like, that's what you're digging up. And that's also why, like, some people are like, why did it take you seven years to write the book? Because it's fucking hard. <laughs> like, oh my God. Yes. Who says that? So many people say it, by the way, like my friends, I was like, if you guys ask me one more time, how much longer it's going to take for me to write this book, like you go through what I went through and then write a book to process it and see how long that takes. You know? Because it is, it is a, th it, it is a, therapeutic process it yeah. is a it is a an unraveling yeah um and 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 re-raveling and a, a re-raveling a revisiting yes a remembering um things that you are, are trying to forget or you have tried to forget or things that you have tried to bury and sweep under the rug well you because. do you know and that's part of the writing process is all of a sudden you start getting into stuff and then one thread leads you to the next and you literally like i said this in the book but you're like a you know a archaeologist on a dig and you're mm -hmm. you just keep digging stuff up stuff that you dissociated because your body is so intelligent that it will hide things from you just to keep you living yeah and because you can't process it you know yeah. and so when you start writing in in the way that i wrote it you uncover that and and mm -hmm. it needs to be titrated like i even recommend i mean so many people like it's amazing how many people have already read this book and i recommend like my my prescription for this is like titrate it and read it slow and do your own work slow because the reason why we're traumatized as a culture is because we are doing too much too fast yeah we've got to we've got to you know pump it out in three four months you know we've got to you know do the yeah. the next thing and the next thing and we've got to yeah move and groove and do all yeah. of the things it, it's it's so interesting oh my gosh i i had something i wanted to talk to you about 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 the about the tv i think that you mentioned um you know all all of that going on i i just i think what i wanted to say about that was uh, again it's been it's been probably 20 minutes ago that we talked yeah. about this yeah but but there was there was something about you know, all of the distractions and that kind of thing. And my thought at the moment, at the moment when you were speaking that was that because we were talking about your, your childhood, your life, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, but sweetheart, you weren't watching TV. You were out doing, you know, those things, right? I mean, I, of course, I'm sure you had exposure to, you know, oh, yeah. kill in front of the TV, but I just, you know, so I, I just watching TV. <laughs> I, just, I was watching some tv that's for sure because i also grew up like i feel like our generation was kind of a tv generation oh yeah we're just like stick them in front of the tv and yes. that was also i that's what i'm talking about like the collective trauma part of our collective trauma is because we grew up watching 90210 and saved by the bell yes that these characters are you know what is the archetype of normal yes. and that if we're not like them we're yes. fucked up yes. so there's a million reasons why we're all fucked up and i i guess like <laughs> my work is to help people unravel that and recognize that like basically everything we've been taught is a bunch of bullshit and that we have to re-educate ourselves and that means we have to re-educate ourselves cognitively and we have to re-educate first and foremost because the traumas actually happen to us in real time in our bodies yeah. and we have to have like a somatic re-education mm. we have to have a re-education of our bodies and we people need to learn how to be in their bodies and when you are just stuck in front of your phone and yep. you're not like out in nature yep. connecting to you know the the og World Wide web which is mushrooms mycelium and you know the forest and the trees yeah. it's like we just need to get back to what matters which is like nature the earth each other and i think we're getting there you know i think we're getting to this place where because we're so sick and tired 
people don't want to be sick and tired anymore. So they're seeking all this alternative stuff. Like, Oh, what's going on with me? I need help. You know, and I that's love how that. it begins is recognizing you need help. I love that. I love that so much. I mean, what I'm thinking about, I'm like maybe just a generation prior, but I'm, I'm like, what I recall is, and, and again, it, it depends on where you grew up. I grew up in the, in the sticks, which was a great place to grow up. Totally. I could totally. run around in the woods and I could do those things. And I, I know, and I did, I mean, and we had three channels on the TV. So it was like, whatever, <laughs> we yeah. didn't have DVRs or anything like that to record, you know? So if you missed your show, you missed your fucking show. It's that's it. That's oh my God, yeah. I know. Yeah. That's and we were, like, our parents, I feel like we were kind of, I was like the last generation of you know, come home when the street lights come on. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, my mom, mm-hmm, my mom mm-hmm. was just busy. My mom was yeah. checked out. She was working. She yep. was, you know, doing other things. And we just got to meander and wander and do really kind of whatever we did when yep. we were young. And that was yep. kind of amazing. But now it's like, again, there's so much fear because we have so much access to technology and social media that we're witnessing all of these like violent, horrific crimes going on out there. So everyone is afraid to let their kids out. <laughs> that by the way, still happened in the seventies, eighties, nineties. It as always well. did. It's just that it we always have happened. access yeah. to see it now. You know, exactly. we see it. We're yeah, really, exactly. we have yeah. more exposure, you know? Yeah. So, you know, that, that comes to, you know, layering on the generational trauma with your own experiential trauma. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the word, the term that you use, but that's what I'm going to go with mm-hmm. and all of that. And it, even, even just thinking about um, your lifetime alone, just in, you know, less than 40 years, you know, you're under, under four decades. It's like even your lifetime, just, just the trauma of your own lifetime and then the generational trauma layered on. So I love your passion in wanting to not only it, it it isn't about sharing what I'm hearing from you is it isn't about sharing your story particularly it's about sharing our story collectively yeah. and it's about putting that out there and it's about however long it took you to get there um, however many times you had to pause and process along the way, um, we are collectively better for it, Hmm. for you putting your work out into the world. I mean, this is, this is what we're here for. Yeah. And I mean, I, like, I really hope my, my vision is that, you know, this book is a call to action to other people to, to look at their lives and to look at what they've been through and to look at, you know, the historical context of not only what they've been through, but maybe your location or your origin or your ancestry or your parents and, and recognize how you could become like this and, you know, accept your humanity and then get better. And it's like, get messy, get shitty and get better. And I I really do hope that, that writing this book starts a movement, you know, of, of, of other people who are willing to come out and be like, okay, I'm going to tell my dirty, rotten, you know, gross, but also beautiful, magical, um, empowering, inspiring story, because that's what we all have. And I don't think none of us should be hiding what we've been through because it doesn't serve any of us. It just keeps us sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I love it. I love it. Okay. Yeah. That was good. Uh, it was. <laughs> I, I, you know, I feel like I, I, I feel like this is it. <laughs> I feel like I feel like this is it. I didn't. I didn't even have a list of questions to ask you. I just wanted to have this conversation. And having read yeah. your book, I was whoa, whoa, mind blown. Yeah. And um, being able to actually focus also on what your purpose was. It's freaking magical. Yeah. That's magical. Yeah. And it's not like, it's, it's all connected, you know, it's, it's all, um, I don't know that anything that I have done is random because it is, it all just keeps to be, it keeps leading into like stepping stones and, 
Um, you know, and that was the book that was just a stepping stone for me. Like, it's not going to be the last thing that I ever put out there, you know, and I'm so glad I did it. And, um, I'm so, I, I just am so enthusiastic to, and excited to see the response that people have. And, you know, I also recognize, you know, not everyone is going to love it. Um, but it's going to serve its purpose. It's going to make its way through the world. Like it has a life of its own now. And that's yeah. kind of the, the crazy, um, piece of, uh, you know, that's really vulnerable for artists is like you yeah. put your heart on the page yeah. and then you just set it free and you yeah. can't control how people receive it or what it does really. That's right. I mean, it's, it, it, it's literally your child. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, this is what you have created. It is a part of you and you put it out there and you do, and you set it free and you're like, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. That's, and that's where I'm at now. It's like, okay, yeah. go fly birdie. You know, yes. yeah. I'm okay with, um, I mean, I have a personal feeling. I've always had a personal feeling about this book, um, that it will do something magical. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also if it just flops, it's fine. It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on. No. Well, <laughs> I tell you what, it's already done something magical for me. Oh, okay. Yeah. And for what that is worth, I will help to spread that magic, you know, take a little bit yeah. of yours and a little bit of mine yeah. and um, use that as inspiration to continue forward with your movement, which is absolutely so much in alignment with mine had a conversation about somatic healing yesterday and like all on board with it yeah totally on board yep. with it needed so needed it so very necessary i'm telling you yes. and it is so crazy like um because i did my somatic experiencing training which is a three-year training but you know how um it's it's a it's not like a, a master's or a phd it's just uh a certificate. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, I mean, it's an amazing certificate, you know, it's a yeah. great tool to have, but I also wanted to have something that felt a little more credible to like a kind of normal person and mm. a credential matters to a lot of people. They're not just going to like go see, you know, the like healer person because it's too much for, you know, some mainstream person. They just, they want to see a credential anyway. So I was looking up, um, uh, there's a really specific program that I want to do. And I found out that they are not doing that somatic psychology program anymore. And I found out there's only two accredited somatic psychotherapy programs in the entire country. Wow. What? Wow. Like, so maybe I don't, I mean, I am, mm. this is my work, you know, this, mm. the, the things that happen to us, they happen to our bodies. It mm -hmm. affects our mind, our physiology, but first and foremost, it happens in real time to our bodies. Mm -hmm. you know, and that is what we don't tend to and care for. Yeah. So yeah. that is, that is in, in fact, I think that is the one thing that we put last. That yeah. is the one thing that we put last. We, we either try, we have already either already detached ourselves from it because of our traumatic experiences yep. Yep. and, and our conditioning over the years. I mean, just, it's, it's, it's a whole, a whole litany of reasons why, but we have become so detached that we're like, yeah. We don't even know how to reconnect anymore. No. We don't even know how to. And no. yoga for sure, you know, the, the fact that you were introduced to yoga at, at the time when you absolutely needed to be, even though you didn't fully understand it. No. I know I have found myself on the mat in tears yeah. sitting there in Shavasana going or laying there in Shavasana going, I don't know why I'm, I'm imploding right now. I have no idea what's coming out of me. I have no idea. Yeah. But that's well, the point, right? That's yes. the point. I'm carrying something yeah. and I have just released because I have moved my body in such a way and I have flowed with it in such a way and I have allowed myself to be fully connected for yeah. a period of time. And I have taken my mind out of the out of the out of the picture in terms of thinking about anything other than what is the next pose what yeah. is the next what what do I need to do to just you know focus myself in this area I I absolutely love yoga in 
oh, so many ways for so yeah. many reasons. And that would definitely be one. It is, uh, yes. it is a full spiritual experience. It is it not. Is. It's it a, is. Yeah. It's, and it's a full, you know, human experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that most people can't put into words, that thing, that whole, um, uh, experience that you just kind of laid out, I can actually mm -hmm. explain it. Um, I can explain it physiologically now. Like I can yeah. explain it neurobiologically now. Like I mm. can explain to people, well, this is why you have those moments. You know, this is why you have a cathartic breakthrough. This is why, because I understand how the body works now. And that is what I didn't understand before. And now there's like a practicality about how all, all of this works and and how our bodies end up protecting us, which mm -hmm. ends up creating these symptoms of trauma because our body's just doing its job trying to protect us. Yeah. Um, that when I didn't understand how my body worked, I, I felt like I was totally out of control. And mm -hmm. what I realized when I realized and did all my, you know, educational work, um, understanding how my body works and this connection, this is what we started with this mind body continuum, mm -hmm. um, has given me so much agency over my own body that like, I, I can influence my mood. I can influence, uh, the regulation of my nervous system. I can take myself up. I can take myself down. And this is what people don't know. And this should be the first thing. This is how we deal with our mental health issues. Yeah. Like this should be the first thing that we're taught in grade school rather than fucking home ec. Like who gives a shit about home ec? That's <laughs> just like, Anyway, Actually, they don't teach that anymore. Oh, they don't. Oh <laughs> no. I remember being in home ec and I was like, why no. are we in here like making pies and all the guys are at wood shop? Like this is just reinforcing everything. Okay. So the generation that came before you <laughs> is sitting here going, we miss that. Hmm. We, miss, we miss that because who, who is teaching that if you don't, hello, ha if you have a childhood like Lauren had. Yeah. Where are you going to learn that shit? Yeah. If not in school. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Saying. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, I so uh, appreciate this and it was amazing. And I feel like we're in terms of what lights us up. I think that um, yeah. we're on the same page, you know, we so are, we this are. Great. Yeah. I work at it. We're going to keep in touch. Yeah. I have, I have a feeling. I have a feeling. Um, well, yeah. I found you on Instagram. So I um, followed you on Instagram and I, you. yeah. And I will, um, thanks for interviewing me or having a conversation with me. Yes. And thanks for sharing about the book. And for, I mean, I like the fact that anyone is paying attention to it is just like mind blowing to me. So thank you so much. This book is mind blowing. It mm -hmm. is. And so I'm going to shout it as loudly as Thank possible you. for anyone who wants to hear about it. Where can listeners find this wonderful work of art? Where um, can they you find, can it? Of find it? You can find it pretty much anywhere. So it's okay. all on all um, major retailers, Target, uh, Amazon, um, you know, Walmart, Goodreads, um, Good Books. If you just Google it. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, if you Google, um, probably my name is easiest, Lauren Dolly Duke, or Shit House a Memoir, but the I has an exclamation point. Mm -hmm. um, it will pop up a bunch of places. And it's interesting because right before I got on with you, like uh, I went through an indie press. And so in uh, independent publishers group doesn't tell us until later on who, what bookstores have ordered this book and, and who will be carrying it. Yeah. Um, at Barnes and Nobles, like the big wigs, you know, we already know it's going to be in all of those places, but, um, the, the independent book retailers that I really want to support, mm -hmm. um, I just Googled my book title and I mm -hmm. saw so many independent bookstores carrying this book. And oh. was like, I mean, that was literally right before I got on with you because I haven't known because no one has told me. And, yeah. and a lot of people haven't ordered yet because, you know, the book wasn't coming out until a certain date. And mm -hmm. so it was really fascinating right before I'm just like, oh my God, Queens, New York, Brooklyn, Astoria, Seattle, Washington, Georgia, Burlington. I mean, I was just like, you know, so amazing. San Francisco, LA, San Diego. And so it's pretty cool. I think that um, my friend did my cover art. She's a pretty well-known artist. And the cover art is like, uh, I think that there's a big piece of the cover art in the, in the 
the, the title, like people are like, uh-huh. what is this? You know, uh-huh. they're picking it up because it's a piece of art, you know. Ooh, it is a piece of art, but the title is crap grabbing yep. too. It'll, it'll exactly. grab you. Oh my gosh. How exciting. That's I'm excited good. for you. This is going to be, I, I, I am feeling it. I am manifesting it for you too. It's like, it's going to, I'm sending that energy. It is going to be an amazing um, experience of putting this, this, this work out into the world. I, I love it. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. Chat soon. Yes. Okay. All right. How fantastic was that? Seriously, it was, I was immersed in that conversation the entire time. I absolutely love, love, love every part of it, especially talking about the intergenerational trauma and recognizing that our parents are simply humans themselves and their parents were too and their parents were too and oh my goodness it is just such an amazing expression what Lauren has done here it is such an amazing story all around okay so it is 100% possible. Everything is possible. There is one thing that I want to share with you. I sent her a voice message uh, the next day because I had reviewed the conversation just to kind of pull out little points here and there so I could put the summary together and help promote the this conversation as well as her book, which again is a, a must read, especially if you have had any kind of childhood like Lauren has had, right? I mean, in any sense of that, it just, oh, it's such a healing expression and knowing that that is her path and that is where she is going and putting that story out into the world and her story is our story and it's all so beautiful. But the message that I sent her was when I listened back to this and I heard her say, you know, you have to um, get bold before you can get better kind of thing. And which, you know, I said, oh, you can use that. And she's like, well, I hope so, because I said it. <laughs> I sent her a message because I thought that was so funny. It's like, okay, well, what I meant in the moment was there are so many ways <laughs> that you can use that, that that term that you just came up with on the fly as we were talking, there are so many ways that you can use that. Not like I was giving her permission to use it. (laughs) So funny. Okay. It is, it is amazing. I love having these conversations and I hope that you enjoy hearing them as well. I will drop links in the show notes. Be sure to check out Ship House wherever books are sold. It is available now. Leave a review for Lauren, please. Uh, drop a review for her on Amazon or wherever you purchase the book and let the world know that her work is appreciated, that the fact that she has literally bled and, and shed all of these tears and done all of these things, I think is, uh, is so, so valuable. So please show her the love about how valuable it is. And uh, while you're at it, drop a review for this podcast too. That would be fantastic. All right. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day whenever or wherever you are. Light up, shine on.